think it's the best offer. I think to pretend that it will never happen, that's not true. Especially, you're right. If we make a success of this, if we make a success of this, and by the way, that's what we've been asked to do, there's going to be pressure. So you're right. But let's just make an intelligent discussion. But, but they already have a historical level of block already, so that would not get any additional funding. Not necessarily. There's no law that's uh, that was put in. By the way, the gentleman says they have a historic overlay. Right. Okay. What I would say, what I would say is when something is very sensitive, do not put it under another law because it's the issue. It shouldn't be your historic overlay that is protecting you from zoning changes. It should be a zoning change law that nobody's sneaking around anything. Well, another thing is yeah, most zoning they contact with the adjacent property owners prior to the zoning. Yeah. But yeah, in our particular case, it's the fact that the zoning is there and it's just not being enforced. Well, that's yeah, and that's true. Well, maybe you can liberate some of these people that are enforcing quarter inch dimensions to enforce zoning. Because they're enforcing little things like math. They're being indiscriminate. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to put into the code, I'm going to put into the code successional zoning. And what that means is we're going to assume that there'll be pressure to up zone and change zoning, but it's going to happen time certain. Let's say every two years. Okay? And it's a discussion. The entire zone comes up for discussion. We have a zone called T. Your, your zoning category called T3, which actually is suburban. By the way, not suburban, suburban. You're less than urban, right? Mm -hmm. Suburban. And there's going to be pressure to go to what's called T4 zoning category. T4 is the same building, but with mixed use. You know, you can't change the building, but you can change the use inside. T5 changes the building. Okay? So every two years, from T3 to T4 comes up for discussion. And you know exactly what the issue is. You know, your house can become an inn up to four rooms, okay. But it comes up for discussion. That's all, that, and I think that's the best way. Yeah. And by the way, don't underestimate. I've been to places where they actually, when it's done rationally, they want the up zone. At first they say, no, no, no. And then they say, well, what are you talking about? And they say, well, you know, that's what you're talking about. I can understand it. Okay, so uh, let's assume success and that what you say is true. There'll be a danger of upzoning, we're going to deal with it. Okay, so let's, let's put that in, in succession. Okay, so there's your street car. By the way, we'd like to have a price, uh, uh, assuming that uh, they don't want the Concord model, it's more like they want the Belgian model. <coughs> yeah, don't let Boeing do it. Yeah, don't let Boeing. You already said. Don't let Boeing do your streetcar. Build them locally like they used to be. What? They used to be built. Oh, Thomas. Thomas. Get a Thomas Bell model. Okay. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is in the bad old days when people did as much as possible to disconnect the African-American neighborhoods from everywhere else, uh, which happened all over this country, nothing special about you. Uh, the highways, you know, when the highways came in, there, it's well known that they went through the African-American neighborhood. And the argument was that it was cheaper real estate. We're gonna buy the real estate. And by the way, nobody minded selling. You know, the government usually pays high. But the fact is, they reamed out the black neighborhoods. And you had a little bit of that here. And Washington Street became disconnected. And there's a lot of talk from people who care about Washington Street who say this, that, and the other. And we say, well, you, know, you already have a plan that knows in detail your little shops and your little everything. And by the way, we're going to go have your fried chicken tonight. Don't worry. We're going to be there. Uh, so we're going to know Washington Street better. But it's not our job. Our job at the scale at which we're working is to reconnect Washington Street to the town center. And I don't know the particular details. I have somebody working on it. Could you guys look at it? You know that problem? <coughs> it might be an expensive little thing to do because there's a highway in between. But that is probably the single most important thing you can do is to connect Washington Street to the new vitality of Kibbutz. Right? 
I know almost nothing about it because somebody else is doing it, but it's it's in there. It's in there? It's in what? It's in your presentation. Isn't it this one? Everybody realizes this is like a freeway, right? This is the part of the Pennsylvania. And then it comes down to the grid, and there's a traffic signal right here. A Washington is back here and currently tees in and stops at the right? And, and the problem is we've got a brand new building in here that's recently constructed relative to the history of the time here. that uh, we think can be made beautiful. Do you realize the abuse? The colors, the, I mean, everything is just so completely abused. Uh, we're going to try and have uh, wider sidewalks, uh, decent colors, all that. Many of them are. You know, what we need is help getting them out of there. And that might require some that there's the beginning and the end of it. I mean, I have no way of getting them out of their leases and so forth. Uh, and they may not even be doing badly as businesses. They may be doing very well, so we don't know. But uh, this, by the way, is the one place that, this, of course, is the correct store, which is the one Each of them, 
perspective, you can actually have dinner on pivot and seamlessly go to the theater and see what the action is at the, at the uh, underground uh, high point. And, uh, that's a lot. And then you can because you can really account, accommodate a lot of their time. So it's independent. Dispersal of our energy. Basically, we need to get going on something. And this is two miles. It's two miles of cool stuff. that could become pedestrian. One way to think about this is actually this could be pedestrian life. But it would be very unusual to do this because that means you have two grids. They're too ambitious. Yes, of course, you can sort of read the way the rail could be. That's kind of said, it's just the case. What's the most important half mile? What's the next most important half mile? And then if you succeed, yeah, you make the railway beautiful. By the way, the railway's not that interesting. We've been, we've been, looking, we've been looking at it, and they say, is it what's wrong with Kutz? you not to just, just because this is low hanging and this is low hanging and this is low hanging you do three things that never connect because you, you'll be exhausted before anything and uh whoever did this was working on this I think that's you need to uh you need to really phase it I made a micro phase it centers that uh, appear in the fire plan. So we're building our fire plan. These are four of the town centers. And of course, we're taking care of two. You know, not all of them. Open space. Uh, you do have a great deal of open space, the fact, the fact that you think you have no parks. Um, certainly, there's some. Well, i tell you the truth, I don't know what they're like. You know, I don't know how good this park is and so forth. I do know that this, this park would make a great deal of difference to have that civic center because it's already so used, you know, that area. Some of these, you know, which are schools and so forth, may or may not be worth the budget. Uh, you shouldn't just do open space because you, for the hell of it, because it's expensive to maintain. This one, where was this one? I like that special 
okay, this special product in the center. Uh, this is pulling together the downtown. This special parking uh, area over here, including the children's museum, which is here. By the way, it's a children's park here. Okay. Uh, this is the main street. Some liner buildings on the Wells Fargo parking lot. A liner building is a building that's very thin, that doesn't, you don't lose any parking, but it masks the parking lot. And actually can also be used for food trucks and so forth underneath. It's basically a building that looks like a complete building, it's inhabited above, but it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't remove any of the parking. Uh, and then the ideas that we've had, you know, for this area that I spoke about earlier. I wasn't expecting this building, this, this drawing to be here. But I, I've sort of spoken of this kind of thing, you know, using my hands. You'll see more of that later. This one, Max? This one is highlighting the removal of the carpet. Yeah, this one is highlighting the removal of the couplet of Kevin. The removal of the couplet of Kevin. Okay, these are the, okay, this is obviously not in order. These are the, the different projects and how they're shown. Oh, you actually tried to do this. Okay, this is uh, this is what I thought could never be drawn. Uh, this is the uh, uh, underground high point that's behind, you know, behind the uh, behind the theater, the movie. <laughs> I do think of volleyball. have one of your, the people who do your special false walls, you know what I mean, the people who can fake marble, get them up there to fake brick on this white building. Bang, raise your hand. <laughs> Full brick. Bang. Full brick Bang. and full mullions. You would see that this is one of the most beautiful loft buildings that you have. It really is beautiful inside. Any photographs? <coughs> The view is glorious. Uh, okay, now one of the things, one of the more interesting ideas, we were asked to demolish this building. Just demolish it. Because it needs sprinklers. And because we can't think of what to do with it. Well, the demolition, that's a solid concrete building. It's beautifully built inside. It's really it's a tough one to demolish. And the reason was we need an auditorium, we need a, an amphitheater. Uh, we found that this useless street here, if it were eliminated and turned into a park, or essentially eliminated, we could keep the building, create an auditorium here, into it, you know, leaving the tree in place, we're using these, this conical restaurant, the ex restaurant as the backstage. So it's an auditorium working in this direction. And then today, for the last few days, Peter has said, well, we can slope in to the stage, we can also slope down to the railway track in a really cool way, and we can bring in trains here, train cars, with you know from the museums all over the United States with dining cars and sleeping cars and educational cars. Like, why not bring in a chemistry lab from a university the way they do in England? You know, and actually have 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 chemistry classes or finishing classes, or why not get your craftsmen to get in a train and go? And in England, they call this the link belt because they can't afford in the towns the university. They have a train that is set up as a university for the specialized classes. And they actually come up and teach the specialized work in the train. And it's called the link belt. And this could be something that you can decant. But whatever it is, even if it's just having uh, cool cars to look at, bringing the, bringing the slope down so that you can actually bring up the cars you know, there's a third track. I think that's probably what I should say. There's two tracks, and there's a third spur that's available for a train to just sit there during at least your uh, your special 
This is an expensive item, but remember we were asked, you know, it's less expensive than the other idea, which was to demolish the whole building and then build the auditorium. And this one, if the building is developed, they can probably uh, pay for the, for the amphitheater. I think it's going to be very exciting. Here's the beginning of the drawings. Uh, we have that. Yes, we have that. Uh, very expensive ideas. Our idea is to take those floors, divide them into four, four lots, perhaps six for smaller ones, and just leave them raw with the plumbing coming in, and we say, lay out your own lot. You know, you have an electrical, uh, you have an electrical harness ready to go, you have the, and you basically make your loft, which is what a loft is. And it's pre-permitted. Uh, this is your parking lot, which pretends to be the center. And then uh, Tom yesterday, Tom Lowe, uh, explained how you can have a green the size of a football field and not lose a single parked car. And that because it's more rational, you can actually use the parking spaces underneath as uh, for uh, vendors. Anyway, same number of cars. I think this is something that should be requested of the people because it is your civic center and it looks awful. So it's all studied. By the way, I just wanted to show you this. Uh, the problem with parking lots is that they're striped and they look like parking lots. If you don't strike them, they look like flaws. This is in Phoenix where we're working. You know, that's a parking space. But it's marked by these little aluminum dots that you hardly see. And so you don't know it's a parking lot. When the cars are gone, it's a square and people come and do things there. And so when we say every parking lot you see us propose is this kind. You know, think of it as a square that every once in a while happens to have cars in it. In your case, very seldom do they have cars. What is this here for? Does anybody know? Permeable surface? Oh yeah. Well, you have you have a lot of impervious surface. It's just amazing. Um, this is uh, Courtney, who, uh, Courtney, how many images, is Courtney here? How many images do you have? Do you, want to, do you want to show them? Yes. Okay. Okay. The idea of uh, having temporary structures, quote unquote temporary, that are so beloved that they become permanent, is a perfect use for the parking lots downtown that are mostly empty. And so Courtney, uh, specializes in doing really, really cool uh, uh, container buildings that are just bolted onto the ground and can come into play uh, during the times between the between the uh, the uh, furniture with your All right, we talked a little bit yesterday about some of the value added by temporary structures and some of these big asphalt stretches that Andres just showed you are key corners and key intersections within your downtown area. So we picked a, a few louder. of these corners. We picked a few of these corners to take a look at for our first temporary types of installations. So the biggest stretch of asphalt you've got is a Kivet and Wren. So this would be the biggest temporary installation that we look at. This is the ideal um, spot for a cafe. This is right in that Kivet Cafe area that we were looking at earlier. Um, and one of the other things that we'd like to point out is that there's no landscaping on this corner. The traffic is very, very fast going around the corner. So there's a couple things that we'll, we'll have to do to make sure that pedestrians feel both comfortable and safe on that corner, and then they have a haven within that space as well that's, that's both removed from the street but still engaged. Could you orient me before you change it? Which one is uh, Kivet? Is this is Kivet. Yeah. And this is Wren. Okay, and this is the parking lot which is the one of the, the western one, no, the eastern one of, uh, of Wells Fargo, right? That's right. All right, 
right? And then this is a smaller footprint installation as an example. Um, this is at Kivet, Maine, which is um, the entire block that's in front of the state building. So this is where we're talking about um, putting in a children's um, installation of some sort, uh, museum, playground, something that's interactive. Um, and this is showing an example of a smaller footprint where you actually have on-street parking here. So this could be a food truck. This could be something that's a, a daily in and out, or it could be a week or a month uh, permanent installation. And your sidewalk is very expansive. So you have the opportunity for smaller vendors, um, uh, daytime type setup, tear down, festivities that would line these parking lots to give you more engagement on the street and start connecting the buildings that you exist and the shops that stay open. Um, this would also work with the children's installation. It can be ice cream, it can be a shop of some sort, it could be a showroom that's visible from the street side and from One the side. One way to think about this, I often see the parents bored watching their kids play. And then I saw in Birmingham, Michigan, somebody had installed a cafe. And the parents were in the cafe having a great old time watching the kids play. And they could stand it a lot more. And they were there, you know, quite long. Because, you know, the parents standing there or sitting on the bench is not the same thing. And I thought, what a perfect combination. So it would be like. And absolutely. And we do that quite a bit, especially if you consider this puts the parents between the street and the installation or the, the children's area. So the safety factor is even up higher once once you've got your parents here and then the children and sort of a safety buffer down behind it. And then we brought a couple more examples just to, to show you some, some ideas of how this has been done really well in other towns. Um, this is in London. This is, an, or this is a restaurant. Um, this one is the shop type example where you can do one level, you can do multiple levels. This has become uh, much more permanent. Like so many of these have, they've become such successful parts of these shops and these businesses and they become a part of the character of the downtown. Some of them end up staying for renewed contracts and this is one of those examples. It's great because when you're parked at the intersection, you can look in and see what they've got on their first floor stock room. And it's also just a, a comfortable place to shop and access from the pedestrian side as well. There's all <coughs> kinds of great ways that we can retrofit these containers so they can still be shipped to and from where they're going. Um, and they're engaging with the street. And this is a beautiful example in Mexico City where exactly like what we're talking about here, the, a group of um, the kind of creative people that we're seeing in your community, the artists, the, the chefs, the uh, artisans and craftsmen, a group of them came together and, and took a couple acres and made this um, the shipping container installation. It's all shipping containers. And the small alleyways and the larger gathering spaces that they were able to create draws people right out of the city to really experience the space. And this is another example of the same thing. It's very basic, but the fact that it gathers people and creates an edge between your, your high traffic areas it leads your pedestrians down both the traffic side and the more internal side and really builds that community pause that we need at each of these corners to, to pull people back into downtown. This is one of the Mexico City spaces. Excuse me. If, if there any of ever been to the back of the Grand uh, yeah. Alliance is a perfect example of it. And it's really successful. We were just there visiting and the amount of foot traffic there is amazing. It's amazing. And it's, it's been going for a long time. A long time. Yeah, a long time. Yeah, long time. Yeah, long time. Yeah, long time. Wow. All right. Great. That's it. Wonderful. Thank Wonderful you. Example. Uh, interesting thing about this is that uh, it's part of what's called tactical urbanism, in which you try it because it's removable. So if it doesn't work, you can remove it, but mostly it stays. So instead of agonizing for a very long time, do we do it, don't we do it, do we do it, don't we do it, just try it and then pull it out. Uh, I think the only difficulty here, you know, having empty parking lots and full buildings, what other idea do you have? Right? Where are we supposed to put this stuff? The buildings are all leased out, but the parking lots are empty. This is tailor-made for that. But we have to be able, we have to be willing to tell the people who, who, who demand all that parking twice, 
choice here that perhaps they can't have it all. They can't have every last car. And besides, what's the difference? If only 15% of your people are parking and 85% are somehow making it, what's, what's 50 cars less? They won't even notice. But there's one other thing that I can say, an idea that we were discussing yesterday. The city owns three parking garages. And the city owns those three parking garages and, and, and the, the market owns them, uses them on the abeyance of the city. You know, they don't automatically have it. That belongs to the citizens. The citizens built them. Why not have the municipality say, those parking spaces of yours, we're replacing with our parking space. You know, the city has a lot of currency in terms of parking. And if it's in beggar mode, in which we're so grateful to give you everything we want, you want, then we have nothing to play with. Because every single parking space that Courtney took away, which are very few, you know, if the market screams about it, then there's absolutely nothing to be done for downtown. There are other things, we've got other ideas, but downtown isn't gonna happen. So I think some of that juggling would be good. Now it requires a, a city council to actually uh, defend the interests of this plan. Oh. Uh, I wanted to show you this because this is actually a very successful restaurant called the Blue Zucchini. Okay. It is completely independent of its environment. Do you understand that just because it's miserable out there doesn't mean it's miserable food? You know, and it could very easily be a wonderful environment with miserable food. This kind of stuff is extremely difficult to dislodge. This is this is north of Lexington, and you know I could actually you know, I could actually draw and pretend that this is going to go away, but essentially north of Lexington it's working. You know these are businesses, and to put people out of business, I don't think it's politically possible. You know I think we might say. We might question whether we should, whether it's even ethical to do it. But the fact is that I don't think you would succeed. You know, when these people come up and say, "But I'm the blue zucchini, and I'm in business, and I'm this, and I'm in business, and you're going to put me out of business with your expensive new ideas," I would say that we should be very careful of, of anything north of Lexington because business is there at work. So I'd like to pull back from that and uh, draw a pretty hard line about where we think we can intervene. These are some of the projects that you see back there that Peter Freeman's uh, firm did before we arrived. Special projects. They're all being adjusted. This is the shortening of the burial of the wires to Lexington. You know, we're shortening it by a third in order to do a better job. I spoke about that earlier. Uh, we are going to try and price the, what this costs, you know, it's difficult to do, to do that, but we're going to try and, and price it. Um, one, of the, one of the problems is that uh, Paul discovered that we have, uh, there's a lot of underground work to be done that was planned to be done. And perhaps it should be done all at once. It's kind of bad news. Which also makes it a little bit easier for the streetcar. Yes, it makes it easier for the streetcar. But you have a mess under the street. That's what's going on under the street. This is the existing section. By the way, don't build cobra heads anymore. This is for highways. Those don't, they blow out your retinas. You know, they're too bright uh, for pedestrians or for cars. And this is how it ends. See, this is how it begins, and this is how it ends, which is a nice street. And this is a Photoshop that uh, Mike did before he left. By the way, this is, you, you realize, this is as nice as it comes. You know, this is the nicest part. It's got two big trees. It's got a really decent building with a setback. And the wires are neat. The wires are not neat. This is, the, this is as nice as it comes. And look how much nicer it can become. You remove the wires. By the way, I also want to make the point that removing the wires doesn't add that much. You won't even notice. What, does, what, the, what you would notice is if you plant, if you make the if you make the uh, planters wider and you put cars there that buffer the pedestrian and you plant trees. This radical work 
is exactly what the main street in Greensboro is. You know, and I would say it's minimal. And if you don't go all the way, it's just not going to work as well. It might not even work at all. And then this is new. <laughs> now they don't have overhead lines, do they? They do. Okay. Hey. Overhead lines. Got it. Thank you, sir. <laughs> we ran out of time. Yeah, you just walk no stations, you walk them. The old way. This is the messy intersection on uh, Parkway and Parkway. Parkway? Parkway. Parkwood. Parkway and Main. Parkway and Main. Uh, this is uh, Parkway to Lindsay and Main. Main. Parkway. Parkway, Elm and Lindsay. Right. And so this is the rep this is the repair that we're going to make, which is a bigger mess. It's even more complex if that's possible. And then this is ours, which is actually quite quite simple. And by the way, Donut, there's also a very nice classical building here, a law office, that would enjoy very much having that as a forecourt. It's a bank. It's a bank. Yeah. And then uh, this is the comparison of Winston Salem. Oh, I didn't know. I thought Winston Salem was the longest. Okay, that's Winston Salem. This is Greensboro. This is your High Point Main Street. It's very long. Going from Lexington to the library, 0.86 miles. This is the quarter mile walk. If you take the intersection of Paris and Main, by the way, that's the name of it, Paris and Main. That's your new Main Street Center, which used to be your new Main Street Center in the old days. Uh, there's quite a lot of people that can walk to it in this pedestrian shed. You can actually walk to the gateway at Lexington all the way to the gateway of the library down at the bottom. Uh, I think this is a little bit out of date. Uh, I was speaking to Javier this morning about how historically south of Paris it's a different building type. Uh, this is being handled in which all the work, the buildings that are being brought up to the street. But historically we noticed that actually the buildings moving up to the street is north of Paris and south of Paris, the historical buildings have setbacks, like the Paris. 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 <coughs> how, do you, how do you propose to handle this? I mean, what do you want to see in the end? The end result? Um, I mean, do you, do you want to see it redeveloped? Do you want to see the houses torn down? Oh, no, no. None of the houses torn down. Actually, I'll tell you what. Uh, I mean, that's a good point. It's a good point. Uh, what I'd like to do is to actually, uh, could you make a note? We want to note the we want to note the likely demolitions. Do you know the French have a code that says <coughs> of national value, of value, acceptable and regrettable. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the French not only preserve things, they actually want to say, if you can get rid of this. Um, I think that we might be able to do a regrettable category. <laughs> uh, well, okay, then in the next block, where you do have things up close. Oh, no, we keep those. Yeah, in a major portion or a part, and that's directly on Main. Do you want to see that transition eventually? No, those are beautiful. I'd like to see them renovated, and in fact have some more built. But do you feel like that's the highest and best use? Yes. Have a part that's directly on Main Yes, the I'll tell you why. <laughs> First of all, Main Street's going to be slower and nicer. First. Second, uh, you know, it's not the Main Street as it is now, it's the Main Street of the future. But second, you know, once this uh, Paris, once this town center starts happening, people are, it's suddenly living in an apartment is not a punishment. Oh, no, no. Yeah. In fact, that's part of the uh, infrastructure you have to have throughout the area. It's just, wouldn't it be better if it was like a pedestal type building with retail on the bottom? Not always, no. Not always. I mean, it would be better. But I think we shouldn't lose that apartment. <coughs> There's also not enough parking for high density building. That's another thing. There's just not enough parking. Because we've already heard, don't you dare go past the alley, right? <laughs> so so we can't find the parking. That's one other thing I wanted to say when you were addressing uh, Johnson Street. That is an incredible neighborhood that they had those alleyways and their parking was addressed in the back. Uh, with carriage houses or, or, or garages or whatever. I mean, that is a true urban style. Sure, it is, yeah. So that you don't have any impediments. Well, you know, uh, 
we're certainly going to make the policy proposal that the alleys should be clear so they can be used so they can be used again. Oh yeah. Now the problem is when the city says you must clear your alleys, people don't agree. They say, no, I'd rather have it the way it is. Uh, I don't sort of want to have a dog in that fight, except to write a to write a policy that the alleys should come back into use. Uh, I've always thought this was one of the most wonderful things I've seen. Those alleys are great. No, yeah. no. Uh, they, they are being used between Johnson and Ming. They are being used. They've got a 15 on the west side. Uh, on, the, on the east side, they're being used. The alleys are being right. used. Right. Should they be 15 miles from the or should they be a, like five? Right. I think they should be a five. You can post them to five, yeah. <laughs> they're just driveways. Alleys should be driveways. They should be. They should be. They should be thought of and paved very, very lightly, like a driveway. You know, you, I think the secret of the alleys is to keep them bumpy and, and, and wet. You know, so they can't speed. If you actually pave them perfectly, then you get the speeding immediately. The alleys are great playgrounds. Also, I'm a bit confused. Are you proposing that all of these streets in the area of this uptown project from the library to Lexington, all the signs, all the streets around the area of these back to two way? I, the only reason I'm curious is because my particular house, I'm virtually surrounded by one way, one way this way, one way that way, one way the other way. So yeah. any changes would come to move. My neighbor and I. We are proposing to do as much as possible two ways. Well, my neighbor and I would need to get into that. We didn't have an alleyway driveway, you know, off of one street. So Wh why wouldn't you be able to do it? Because there's no way to get into that. A one way street coming into a one way street this way, you're going to put a stoplight in our drive. Okay, uh, show me afterward. I'll look at it. Okay. okay, by the way. I can't get, he's going to get into detail, I'm not going to get into detail, you understand my problem, right? I'm doing a whole city, yeah. uh, we haven't been asked to do your place, We're, it's a courtesy. You know, something that doesn't change you. What I don't want to do is wake up too many dogs. And, you know, I've woken you up by, by, by trying to help. And just, you know, I've got fans. I've been around for a long time. No, no, but we're not asked to work in your area. We, we didn't have to do it. We're, as a courtesy, we're trying to help. If I get involved in your driveway, I'm pulling out. Right. I, no, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. Okay. I'm here for information. I know you understand that, but you're not acting that way. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm asking questions. Okay. Yes, the best thing that could happen is that all the streets become two ways because it slows things out, and you should be able to make a left or a right turn. There are millions of two-way streets that get into alleys. I don't understand. He's going to mind it. You might try to explain to him what your problem is, but I doubt that it's a problem. Okay, because it happens all the time. I forget that issue. Okay. The, the one that was more concerned about. Uh, just no. Uh, no, no, no let, 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 this may be an important issue. What is it? It's, it's a cornerstone property of our city, which is on the corner of theirs. That's burnt. Right. Yes. Um, do you have any plans to try to get involved in trying to save that, or would you please? I think it should be rebuilt, no? Is there any way that you can give us some ideas or help any way you can? To but to do to what? Help to do what? Help to try to save it. It burned out. Burnt. But I know to, re to yeah, prevent it from being torn down. Oh, I don't know the condition. It was burnt. Yeah. yeah. So does it, but can it be rebuilt? See, right now you have very low real estate value. Yeah. You know, there are houses for sale that are under $200,000. If that house costs three or four to rebuild, it probably won't be. Now, the, if, you know, I just, I don't know, I mean, it's just, it's just the financial. But it should be rebuilt as a house, don't you think? Definitely. It just may not be rebuilt as that house. Right. Well, yeah. no, I mean, it just, we have, we've been working on it. We have a party that's willing to buy it and do it. But, okay. But I just wanted to. We could ask no, no, get them to do it. Yeah. No, no, I tried to avoid it. Notice how I knew what it was? No, I said, no, I don't want to deal with it. No, and as far as my house goes, no, I, didn't, I wasn't trying to ask yeah. to get involved. Yeah. Please, please no, we don't. Me. Don't worry, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I can't get involved. I we're, just, we're looking at the biggest issues. Okay, now.
This is your library. This is a flattering photograph uh, because it has no cars in front blocking the, the gate. And actually, the, the, the entrance is, uh, is, uh, is uh, very low. Now, somebody had the idea, which I thought was excellent, excellent to put, you know, to put the, the great canopy on top so it can be signaled that it's something. And by the way, another thing we're doing is putting a green in front with a square, actually a kind of oval square surrounding it, which is a beautiful approach. And I think we may even have the drums. Here it is. Okay, so what happens is we, this would be the exit. When you come down, you can actually see the library. And by actually putting the parking underneath the trees, you see, like this, this can actually become quite beautiful like that and we scale that up a lot of the parking is in the back this is the uh, donut store and this is a future building that actually defines a forecourt and on that forecourt can go the farmer's market which is now pretty pathetic yeah. uh, and uh, nicely enough this is going to be a beautiful place here I, and we're actually we're going to do an even better job on the parking it's not that beautiful here it's going to be a beautiful place and the other side is a beautiful church. So this is the termination. This is the, you know how there's a gateway on the other side at Lexington? This is the last termination of the mile, and then you get into, into uh, a strip again, strip development. So that was a lucky thing. And this will get better and better, and we'll render it. I hope this happens. Uh, these, oh, this is yours. This is the injury and death on that intersection alone. But that's because it's one way. You know, it's people speeding. And uh, they don't stop. It's hard to make a decision and so forth. So that's, uh, that was uh, courtesy of one of you all. What you researched it and brought it in. That's on Johnson, right? Yeah, uh, yes. Well, the, yeah, the circles should be over one block. But that gentleman had, had to move over to the west side because it was too dangerous for is this here? Yes. Yeah. This intersection. You sure? Most of them are very Yes, that's Johnson. This is yes. Johnson. Yes. And this is Ferris and Johnson. He, two, the circles in the wrong place. Yes. So I mean, you've got the, you've got the evidence that this thing doesn't work at all, and some are deaths, right? Not just accidents. I mean, at least that's what somebody told. That's what he says that there were big What is this? That is John. Beautiful. But it's an absolutely beautiful street. That's why we want to keep it that way. <coughs> absolutely beautiful. Nice street, yeah. Yeah, it's great. So this is the one way, two way game, right? Oh, no, this is or this alleys. homeowners, but unless the city coordinates and does it, it can't be done. It's like, for example, in most cities, the sidewalk has to be maintained by the owner. But the city does the work. And I think if you do that with the alleys... I don't think any other have any problem with picking up or I think just at the point when it's rebuilding asphalt, it's just a little bit out of And you can't do it a bit at a time, because it has to be 
has to be done as a whole. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it would have been, yeah. It's just not our ability. Yeah. We're, we're on the commercial side of that. We need to be careful to get together and have some kind of alley association. We can get together and do that. Alley association. Right now, there's no way to see. That's the solution is to have an alley association per block. Not an alley association for the city, but an alley association per block. Maybe some of the alley cats. <laughs> <laughs> you do have to make a gentleman out of the people that you don't want my walking through the alleyways that are. Yeah. That's why I'm glad the alleyways are on. I might have Well, there's a negative element, yeah, but it's also they're walking in the front. By the way, just so you know, uh, not, not, not. by the way, I was, uh, I was robbed. One night, yeah. thanks to an alley that was not, yeah, my wallet was gone, my checkbook was gone, my briefcases were gone, everything, thanks to an alley that was not cleared of its landscape. So the problem is not, the problem is when the alley isn't cleared. That was uh, Friday night. Yeah. And I've never been mugged before. Well, you weren't mugged. I wasn't mugged, they just stole my stuff. Yeah. But it was in the, no, it was a couple of nights ago. No, the policeman was terrific, everything was terrific, but it was not, but it was in the bushes. You know, it was, it was a very bushy alley that was back there. I'm not blaming anybody, but, but uh, and the more people are in the place, it's, 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 it's eyes on the street, etc. Oh, okay. This is the mall. God, this is a huge project. <laughs> it never ends. <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't know there were so many slides because I would have done. Okay, so this is the mall, which is trem has tremendous potential. Uh, this is a drawings getting better and better of the different kinds of things that can happen in the mall. The small shops that can become artist studios above the large big boxes that can have the bigger machines and the display and exhibition areas. You know, you can have, there's some call for exhibition areas that can happen in the department stores, and then the parking lot can be taken out one <coughs> quadrant at a time, and, uh, and young people can be allowed to build cabins. You know, the way that their, their uh, parents and grandparents were allowed to build cabins without a lot of interference, using the parking lot as a footing. Uh, and you can see that it's, it's really pretty cool. You know, you can actually create a place. You keep the trees, but you create a place that is as walkable and intimate as some of the slides that uh, Courtney was showing. You know, really wonderful little places, very attractive, inexpensive. Uh, this would be a pink zone, you know, a light red tape zone. And we were asked also to look at the, at the lake, uh, at the, the uh, the, the retention pond back here and to incorporate it as a park. This building is already in action with, uh, with uh, 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 High Point University. It's their health services. And by the way, this Target is the world's perfect department store. You know, if you live here, you can actually buy virtually everything you want except food there. Target is, is a great department store. And uh, it would actually, you can envision having people living without a car uh, right there. So you're saying run your business at the growth shop and then live there too? Oh, yeah, live, live. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Live, live there uh, and uh, without too much supervision. <laughs> and so the, uh, uh, this is the uh, housing for apprentices. You know, my dream is to get the young architects out of North Carolina State, you know, uh, out, of, out of all your architecture schools to start building the coolest buildings you've ever seen here. Instead of having to wait 10 years before they're mature enough to, to get a permit. And just to get together with your fellow entrepreneurs and, and build housing, yep. Yeah. Actually, they're so networked, these kids, that they might actually be brought here already on, on the basis of the renderings. 
doesn't even have to be built. Just the chance to do something while you're under 25 is virtually impossible. Have you noticed that? You can't, you can't do anything. And this would be the great place where they can do it. What? Yeah. Yeah. You know, there is a case they could do a studio competition. Yes. In some of these schools for that. That would be great. That would be wonderful to arrange it, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay, let's, they, let's write that down. So the decathlon, where they just take a okay. you know, big empty space and have a whole bunch of teams come together and build a temporary city, which ends up not being so temporary. You know, uh, Brian, uh, uh, Brian, you know, there are lots of these solar decathlon houses. Where are they sitting? Where, where are they sitting? Because you know, there are dozens of they, them. They go up Could they all be brought here? There's a competition every year that takes place on the mall. And the architecture schools build these temporary houses that are solar houses, and then one of them wins, and then they go somewhere. They get taken down. They, That's it. And they could be just be brought here. Essentially, all of our furniture we show is marketing. That you can actually furnish these. Yeah. Not only that, but the furniture, the, the, yeah. it, it, it fit the furniture, the furniture fit the house. Yeah. yeah only two times have been houses built here in the The residential was about Timberlake, the other house was to floor, and then we can move smaller to the floor. They would get the chair and the house up, design some furniture built. But of all the things, he put this house in Lake Tennessee, Greensburg. We can, uh, this is only a small and cooler extension of things that are happening already, that's what you're saying. They build a solar decathlon. <laughs> you know, in our new towns, they have, uh, uh, the developers build uh, show houses. Not just show rooms, but show houses, and they get published. This is an extension of that. So people know how to do this. Uh, one of the things we need to find out is to, uh, who's going to organize it. My preference is the is uh, High Point University that owns it, you know, and uh, and see if they can get on with it, but really quickly. By the way, the last two stores don't have to move out. You know, it might even be nice to have a builder there. They might even get some clients. <laughs> you <do> something else. <laughs> Plus, if they build the houses here. Yeah, okay, that's good. By the way, you could also use the craftsmen that, what are they doing in the meantime? Because we understand that there's a ramp up, what are they doing in the meantime? Build a house. They could do it. Okay, here's the little downside, which is that the, the, uh, the people of, of the international, what are the three missiles? IMC. IMC. They want people inside shopping. One of, the, one of my worst nightmares is that every cool idea we have actually brings people out from the, their principal business, which is keeping people indoors. You know, uh, I have heard that they don't want people eating out, they don't want to have fun, they don't, you know, because they're very hard working when they're here in, in, uh, in High Point because there's nothing, nothing else to do. And virtually every idea we've had is something else to do. And so we'll have to see how that works. But I don't think they're going to be that sympathetic. Yeah. 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 Okay, see what this gentleman says? Yeah. The successful convention centers actually offer other things to do. I completely agree with that. I agree, I, I agree with that. I agree to that. This is your house more right. developed. It's easier to get from one indoor place to another indoor place. Yeah. yeah. I think you can actually draw larger attendances to the, the convention yeah. if the city is more vibrant. Right. The kind of things to do is a big part of our decline. Then we need to change. We've been in decline. 
Yeah. You can see the vacancies. Well, you've been in decline, but you have also been seen much worse times. You know, I get both. Things have been ramping up also for a while, no, not just in the last year, and also ramping down. It's a it's, uh, mixed bag. Mixed bag, yeah. Yeah? Sir. Well, this, this panel is first part of the the Bible. The main capital and open capital the lady group own now 67 half percent of the building. They do not control all the keys to the building. So, so very much, usually you go to a convention, you go to one building, when you lock the door, you're locked, period. We're here, sometimes somebody might make a big deal at 11 o'clock in line. So they do go out, but it's not. Yeah. Nobody, nobody, I don't understand, I've watched it all my life. Yeah. Really not. Well, they do go out, but it's not that much to do. Okay. Well, but that's not, that's not true either, because I know a guy like Terry Sites entertains 40 people who can't fill the house specifically to entertain people. So every night, about eight nights, and four people. In fact, one of the most interesting stories was that Daniel Wood left Cuts of Harry's to start Blue Market Resource. The one thing was almost seven to find is what's going to happen to Wood, because we have a three hundred acre farm, everybody went down there. Well, there's also one other thing that I see, and uh, which is, I went to a lot of showrooms, and the range of design was pretty steadily in the middle. You know, the really cool stuff. I was, I said, where's the cool stuff? By the way, designers told me this. You know, I went to a Canadian designer, and he says, this is what we do here, but I have cooler stuff, you know. And I say, where is it? He says, Frankfurt, and. Uh, Frankfurt and uh, where Milan, right? And then there's the other stuff, which is the whole IKEA world there. And right now, what I see, the vulnerability of high point is this very steady middle. And I know it's very hard to achieve the high, but you know, the younger people are mobbing IKEA. You know, that, and IKEA, I think anybody who considers the IKEA model to be the enemy, I don't know what kind of a future you have. I mean, I think that's a problem. And these, this might be the next generation of high point being incubated right here. Absolutely. Yeah. It's easy to become Ralph Lauren, Calvin Klein, Don Karen, Bob Stewart, this town because it's so small, because you go to a restaurant and that might be Lemonade's over there, Marshall Pete's over there, and you see carpet over here. So if we go out and eat in New York City as a buyer for belts and we got the Ralph Lauren salesman. Well, what happens when I meet designers who figure out that I'm a designer? Listen to this, because this is really important. So I go to one of these things, and, I'm, and um, somebody decides I'm important, and they want to introduce me to their designer. Okay, the designer realizes I'm cool, and he immediately apologizes for his furniture. <laughs> I say, show me this stuff, and he says, oh, don't worry about this, my cool stuff is somewhere else. Like, what's wrong with that? There's something wrong with that picture. There's something really wrong with that picture in which you say, yeah, but we make six million dollars here in High Point, but don't look at this, because I don't give a damn about this. It's my really cool stuff is here, and he slips me a catalog of something else. But, but why can't but why can't you get that right away? So see what's happening with the market used to be is they sold the big box stores. Right. And everybody would knock everybody off. And it was all about price points. Yeah. And then what what's happening now actually because of the economic crisis is people are getting more creative. They're get they're starting to get in even more creative. Yeah. But it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. And they're still worried about are they gonna sell multiple or are they gonna just sell one or two to designers? We're becoming more of a designer market. And, and uh, but the, the designers are young and, and hungry. Oh, the other way, by the way, uh, just one thing. I'm a designer, so. The, uh, the, uh, where are the young people? Yeah, not that many. Okay. Uh, the other day I was having pizza at the Blue Ross. And I'm smoking a cigar so I can't go inside. And this young woman comes out to smoke a cigarette. She sits next to me and tells me her story. She's not a designer. She knows who I am because she's read the newspapers, and she brings her buddies out. And her buddies are all edgy designers, you know, in the bars and so forth. 
And I said, what do you want? And it was the whole thing. Can I get a loft downtown? Can I do this? Can I do this? Can I start? So of course I test the ideas. I said, how would you like this? Okay, you know, I, verbally, no drawings. He said, coolest thing I ever saw. And I said, could you bring people in? And he said, we could fill it. We could absolutely fill it. Because you know why? We can't afford New York. This is Carol Gregg of Red Egg. Yeah. You were going to go see this. Yes. The cool stuff that I point is not in the downtown, the outlying Rogue showroom. Yeah. That's that's where the designers come to find That's where they are, yeah. And they can find me a way to I see. And they're not controlled by the main capital and open capital related. They have some approval. Yeah, I know what you mean. All my life I have not been controlled by those three also. <laughs> <laughs> I know them all. The other thing is people that do their novel stuff, which I've never been to before, I hope you go to next week, the contemporary show in New York, they come down here because there's so much competition. I, they fail. Yeah. Ralph Lauren himself to come to town, they for seven, have a knockout show for free. Best place to hide from, far the place because he doesn't know anybody. Yeah. So it's very difficult to establish the relationship with that with Palm Beach, Palm Street, or Palm Beach. Well, all this needs is to allow it to happen. You know, uh, the university that owns it at a very low cost basis. The, uh, the city that uh, has to understand what it's like to give permits to this kind of thing. Uh, the, uh, you know, the big, the big, uh, the big uh, real estate owners to not somehow undermine it by making phone calls in the night. You know, that kind of thing. I really don't want that to happen. They have every right to do that. I really don't want that to happen, but it's a very big monster. It's a sacred monster that can make a phone call in the night, and suddenly it doesn't happen. So. But they have to, They don't have any budgets. We have budgets. Yeah. Okay. Good. They have taxes. But I like your spirit. <laughs> so these are great. Look at these great little shanty towns. Look at them all. Phasing and so forth. Oh, and this is cool. This is. Do you want to talk about this? Yeah. Right. So there's a lot to go through, but essentially each of the um, each of the different areas of the mall, this is about the size of a small town, this whole area. You could you could walk it'd probably take you about ten or fifteen minutes to walk from one end to the other. It's it's the perfect size for a city. Um, and like Andres mentioned previously, the the interior you would call a street, if you imagine an indoor shopping mall as a very perfectly designed commercial street, is about eight hundred feet from one big box to the other big box. It's a very short distance. It takes you less than five minutes. Move over to see the light. Oh, sure, sure. Move over here by this path. Come to this side. Sure. This guy is small. Fine. They actually want to read this stuff. <laughs> it's interesting. All right. So um, I'm going to start with the interior of the mall. Um, each of the different big box stores will have a different function to it. Um, there are a couple of them left will let them be in business, but the ones that are empty can be taken over by the university um, and allow for very low cost uh, shop, like workshop, um, gallery spaces, small crafts areas, uh, places for people to sell and practice their crafts um, without spending a ton of money on retail space. Um, so there would be an area for metal and woodworking, an area for fabric, an area that's a culinary arts institute next to the food court, which is already set up for cooking. Right? So we have all of these different trades converging on the same place. And this would be a place that would be ideal for uh, graduating students from High Point University to begin incubating their own businesses. Inside the liner shops on the ground floor, you have cheap commercial space for these graduates to move in. The liner stores on the second floor um, are uh, kind of a mixed, uh, partially residential, partially commercial. I think there's a slide for that. So and then, Matt, okay, do you want to talk about the different phases of the development? Well, okay, this is what he's talking about. Just, just really quick before, you know, you, you did say just like the graduates of one university, and, and, and really it's more about uh, uh, two parallel tracks. 
that you can that you can follow. One one is that education is moving towards vocational training, and that's something that we have to be ready for. It's something that uh, that universities should think about moving into. And if they don't think about moving into it, somebody's going to provide it. So uh, we're saying, well, why not think about how there's a synergy between uh, vocational training and uh, traditional business training and entrepreneurship in universities, and actually allow for both and marrying them together. So the, the idea of the big boxes, the big boxes provide space for big workshops and shared resources. So if you come in, learn vocational training, they're possibly under as an apprentice to a craftsman, right? And so that system then builds a new craftsmen who can then work with the entrepreneurs to create new businesses. So right. you can take those pieces together. And most of these departments exist in High Point University. Mm -hmm. They're just wearing bow ties or something. Yeah. Right. And they have are to you, come here. Are you familiar with Tech Shop? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Tech Shop, as you know, they have what, 10 or 12 tech shops in the country. Yep. They just opened the one in Detroit and four yep. of those. Yeah, four. Yeah, four just had 3,000 of their employees to be members of memberships at Tech Shop. Yeah. That's kind of what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they've been partnering with Tech Shop. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be a great thing. Right. The thing about Tech Shop, see, the, they have one in Raleigh, and of course, the big deal is you need. You have to have somebody in there because you can get memberships. You can get up salesmen in there to actually sell memberships so you will be able to. Yeah. Now, what TechShop doesn't do so much is focus as heavily on education. Right. And a place like Third Ward in, in New York, they focus more on the educational portion of it. I so you like to sort of marry those. I'd right. like to talk to you. I have a young man who just won a Fulbright scholarship. He's on his way back to Costa Rica, and that's exactly what he wants to do, right. which would fit right into what you're doing. Yeah. But we're in a conversation. Look at the, just so you, you should begin by looking at the drawing. Right. What so happens is there's a first floor and a second floor, and they're different. They're different ideas. Right. right. These are, these are, the, these are the, the, the shops inside the mall on, on the main floor. Right. So naturally, in the center, you have your, your street where you're able to walk through first and second floor. What happens on the ground floor is you have the regular commercial space, but above that, you have these residences. Um, and imagine living in a, in a one of those shops, there's no natural light. So what we do is uh, actually punch a hole through the, uh, the structural grid of the roof. So if you imagine that the, the mall has a structural grid, like these columns you see in this room, we actually take the ceiling out in between a set of columns, punch it through, plant a tree, let light into these courtyards. It actually creates a very nice living space inside the mall and create uh, a nice little residential community. Now these units here are designed as four different types of units depending on the size of the lots, it kind of varies in the mall. So, um, and that's, that's, here, based on, that's based on the grid spacing. Right. So there's a, there's, a, there's a consistent grid spacing, except when they turn, or there's other situations right. where the grids may be closer or further apart. So these are designed to be as flexible as possible. It's color-coded. Scenarios. So this green space up here at the front, this is the walkway. Um, these are actually public slash private spaces where you could actually walk into somebody's residence and it's their workshop or their studio where they're actually working at home, they've got their stuff laid out, they may even actually be selling things and you can have conversations with the artisans and the entrepreneurs that are living there. Um, some of the units are, are two room units, so you can actually have partnerships living in the same space, an artist and a business minded person together constantly in collaboration, building um, and um, uh, here is the, uh, the courtyards that are punched out of the, uh, of the spaces. You notice all the rooms are situated around the courtyards, light comes from all of the sides. I can't wait to move here from Miami. <laughs> right? This is going to be so cool. Um, this is what very cheap space for students who are graduating to move into, to stay in the city, and to build um, this great, like we call it, making a community. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of uh, live work. There are three kinds of live work. Live, one of which is live nearby, which you can walk to your job. One is live above, which theoretically can happen here. Right. You can actually live here. In the little ones, you can live above a shop. And then there's live within, in which you live with your work. And you actually have a table, and you're, you read the New York Times here, eat here, and cut cloth there. And that's the live within. I suspect that the larger ones are the live within. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes you want to live above. And that actually some people could live here and then go to the big shop down in the mall. So this completely clears up. You know, relationship.
relationships you can have to work. Well, and the interesting piece uh, of it as well is, you know, the next piece down here is that you have bigger, bigger uh, uh, workspaces or studios on the bottom. But the idea isn't that they're permanent housing for one person for their life. But the idea is you get people in and you put them together and you train them. They can live there while they're being while well, the training and location and the training and business, and then you put them into this space so that they can really concentrate on launching a business, and then we, we move them we move them from a small space to to a bigger space, and then out to the world. You know, it's really about making that cycle. Who does all of that? I mean, I understand the architecture and getting you know, getting all the out and getting the but who runs the show once you turn the key over to whoever's going to? Well, uh, I've seen uh, Nito Cobain run a university down to the honestly uh, he actually knows what armchair is scratched i've actually seen that i got a check from him the other day for three hundred dollars and he signed it personally yeah and he said you know this armchair is still scratched yeah. I mean, whoa uh now we have i think we have a management genius among us yeah. the question is whether he can get interested in because this is a totally, you know, the, that university has the skill set, it's got the ambition. The question is whether this is the ethos of it, because this is a craftsmanly, disorderly ethos, and he is into an extremely, you know, it's a different ethos, and it's incredibly successful. So, is that compatible? That's the question. Um, I teach at Hyde University, and I curate and direct their art galleries. What's happening with the students that are graduating, the design students, they see the potential for staying in this area. They've had internships, they've had opportunities to work the furniture market. They want to stay in the high point. And um, what they're finding is, of course, they want to on one level, but then on the other hand, there's nothing here. So, and then the other issue, yeah, there's no place to go, but the other issue for them is that they, um, they are getting jobs that are not creative. Um, they're getting jobs, I mean, they're dying to get jobs in the design field, they're getting jobs in the design field, some of them, and then they don't have a creative outlet. So this could be a creative outlet for them where they can and, you know, and, showcase their, what they can do. And what about the other 330,000 students? Yeah. <laughs> because it's only 5,000 exactly. of them. Yeah, exactly. I think the, the, the big boxes are also big enough that you can, you can have a membership system like Tech Shop for people yeah. that aren't right. necessarily in there because right. they're and the other, the other thing that, that was mentioned here is the fact that with the design students, it is the fact that we still have to learn how that you can be in High Point, North Carolina, and your client can be in Hong Kong, right? That's what you're saying. In other words, if you have a place like this and you're a design student at High Point University graduate and you get in your round here, your clientele may be in yeah. Rio yeah. Or, or Hong Kong. And that's where Yes, but there's still synergy. Like for example, yeah. there are a lot of people operating that way yeah. in their own lonesome cells. This is a completely different, totally exciting thing. What was the next place we went to in Greensboro? What was it called yesterday? Elsewhere. Elsewhere. Elsewhere, yeah. 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 Cool You've seen that? Elsewhere. Yeah. 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 That yeah. was a local yeah. club. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. Yeah. Like my life. Well, I got a lot. I feel like writing a, uh, a dissertation <laughs> on it. <laughs> <laughs> also, let me share something with you also about there's a thing called the Furniture Society, which many craftsmen are members of. They have small shows in Rhode Island, they have them in Boston, they have them in different places. Now, these people never come to High Point. We have all this here, and those people, we're not, don't have a system. Furniture Society people don't come to High Point, they're craftsmen. That has been this unbelievable mystery to me. Uh, we had the guy, Ted Hall's president of Shotbot, who makes CC routers up in Durham. He made a speech at Shotbot. One of the other guys was, was Carl Bass, who's president of Autodesk. Okay, and and you know he's never been to High Point. These people like this. So there's that group of people mm -hmm. that we should be able to bring down. Here. Yeah, and you have to you have to build the community, and 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 also, but also if you give them, you know, one one thing that we found interesting. Uh, working on a small scale of a similar space in, in Miami is 
that, that there's a lot of people who want to, um, who want an outlet of education they want to teach. You know, and I think that you can actually start to pull that together by, by bringing them in to teach, you know, the CNC routers, to teach about how you make them, uh, what, you know, how to use them, you know, what you can do with them. You and know. also that'd be a business. Absolutely. You know, business. By the way, oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah, how to, how to start a business. And just the, uh, yeah. one of the things I saw in your magazine was the 3D printers. Yeah. In which you can actually make absolutely anything. You know, well, it's uh, also it could also it could also what I, what I love about this is that it isn't just art; it's useful stuff. Right. right. Well, we have the Center for Design and Innovation, which is in Winston Salem, Carol Strohacker with, with MIT, and there the main focus of the CDI was two. One was 3D printing. She's, they're building a 14 million dollar building over there for her right now. Steady, uh, uh, 3D printing and also motion capturing for animators and for that's what their mandate is. And so okay, well, that's detailed. I'm sorry. I've got to really sorry. police this. This is, yeah, that's a lot yeah, of these more slides. A couple of things. Uh, we're going to look at more and more into these. Uh, I can think of uh, a huge number of people that live in places like this, and I can see how the fire marshal has never seen a single one of them. You know, like, what's a courtyard? Show me a courtyard. I say, well, here's a ticket to Miami or to one of our new towns. You see what I'm saying? Then he knows what a courtyard is. But whatever it is, all of this is uh, a lot easier to live in and safer than a high rise. You know, it's all, it's all what it's relative to. A couple of things. Um, the, the programming of this is, uh, is whatever the proposal is. This is a huge bucket or basket where you just keep dumping. It's so big that that idea and that idea and that idea can just be dumped in it. It's really great. But it, but I urge you, it's got to be cheap. Yeah. The minute you make it costly, you lose it because the prerequisite is that it's not it, is that is that a cheap space you can incubate. Yep. Yeah. So, are there examples of this? There's, there are examples I mean, of the makerspace piece of it. There's examples of the vocational education piece, but then they they haven't been brought together. It's not been brought. Up. No. Yeah. This but, is huge. Yes, and uh, it's a grafting together of Soho. Um, um, stuff that's happening in architecture schools, uh, shanty towns in Costa Rica. You know what I'm saying? It's it's one of these things that pulls together so many ideas in one, which is what's exciting. One of the things that your village reminds me of is the German garden house. Oh yes, yes. yes. Where they have the buildings built to the side, they try and then it. inside yeah. the courtyard they divide that up, and people rent those spaces and build yeah. their little houses. I wrote a book on that, by the way. Did you? Yeah. 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 About a year ago. Love uh, the, um, the, uh, the agricultural component is uh, something you should emphasize. Well, yeah. that, that's, that's yeah. actually out there in, I mean, we only put, we only put little pieces of it in here, and we can, we can look at it more. But that's, that's where we had said, you know, really quickly we said that we can do some container gardens adjacent to the Culinary Institute. Um, but that's not even looking at the fact that within these blocks, you know, container gardening is going to be a really important aspect. The, the problem is going to be getting people to leave after they've been successful. <laughs> yeah. well, the, the other piece we didn't really talk about, we had mentioned before, I had, I had said there's a scrapyard which is different than a junkyard because a scrapyard you're taking things apart, uh, putting them in bins, and reusing them. So it's really sort of like a recycling system. Not recycling, you're not, you know, you're not melting down plastic, but you're taking apart things and reusing the pieces later in, in new production. And so that's, you know, that's. That's next to the ceramics and arts, which is next to the wood, the, the wooden uh, metal shops, like those sorts of things. You, you work in the synergies. Okay, what else? Did we show all this? What else? I hope this is the end of it. Yeah, no, we, don't, we don't need to go into those details. And just some, some interior ornaments. So this is what happens when the millennials who um, are reusing a lot of materials and getting really creative take over the interior of a shopping mall. It's kind of. What's interesting about these views, you don't have to reconfigure or rebuild or deconstruct anything in the mall. It's just about redecorating and adding to it and creating a culture within it. So people are creating living rooms in the middle of the walkway or setting up tables or exhibits or, or soapboxing in the middle of the, the food court just because they can and because people expect that kind of culture. So this is this is downstairs, and this is upstairs. The housing and, and, uh, and the, the, the 
the shops and community space. Okay, and then uh, this is not highly developed yet, but we can easily turn the college village into a college village uh, and ma uh, making it a mixed use, a mixed use place. We're going to develop that in detail. By the way, we also wrote a book on retrofitting suburbia. You know, uh, taking each of the 17 building types of suburbia, the subdivision, the office park, the strip shopping center. What, suburbia is very normative, and all of it really has to survive, has to become mixed use and walkable. And most of it is adaptable to this. And uh, in most places, we spend a lot of time wowing you with wonderful creative ideas for taking that strip shopping center and making it into a mixed use village of a first rate kind. Nothing, you know, just perfectly as good as anything. And I just want to say, because there's so many other problems and great, even more interesting ideas that we've de we de emphasized that. But in the end, we will deliver a college town uh, of, uh, you know, a traditional way. Uh, actually, a college town that's going to look like Palmer Square to Princeton. In other words, very much in the ethos of, uh, of uh, High Point University, which is a pretty elegant place. But this won't be the town center of uh, High Point University, you know, where, we're, where we've just been discussing. That it's, it's a different kind of place. Well, here's the design done. We just have to render it. Okay.